Around the world, a major development challenge is how to increase income and employment for poor people in a sustainable and cost-effective manner. The value chain approach is one method of effectively linking large numbers of small farmers or micro-enterprises into more competitive, growing and viable industries at the local, national and global level. In this film, we apply value chain analysis to a subsector of the Nigerian fisheries industry, farmed catfish. Focusing on Wari, a town in the Niger Delta region, this will allow us to understand the proper opportunities in the sector and to develop a strategy to cost effectively stimulate the growth of that industry. Value chain analysis has three distinct phases. The first is to understand the structure of the industry and its supporting environment. We learn who is involved in the industry and the roles they play. We learn about the roles and the importance of the supporting services and the enabling environment on the sector. The second phase is to understand the various dynamics in the sector, how the sector has evolved and the forces that have driven or restrained that evolution. This lays the foundation for developing a growth and intervention strategy. The final phase is to identify strategies to address those constraints. The right strategic intervention will stimulate and accelerate the industry's sustainable growth, leveraging more jobs and increasing household incomes. Helping each farmer one by one is very expensive. Finding ways to reach large numbers of value chain actors at a time by using leverage improves cost effectiveness. We have selected the fisheries industry in Nigeria because it meets the three main criteria which can lead to significant impact. It employs hundreds of thousands of poor people in the rural areas in Nigeria. Nigerians consume about 1.5 million tons per annum. Since half of that is imported, there is scope for significant increases in local production and competitiveness. Fisheries also offers many opportunities for proper interventions. With so many participants and a strong growth potential, proper support can stimulate increases in income to many poor households. Whereas captured fisheries is growing slowly at 2.3% per annum, aquaculture or fish farming is the fastest growing segment of the fisheries industry, growing at more than 30% per annum over the last decade. Value chain analysis can help us understand why aquaculture is growing so much faster and the opportunities for accelerating that growth, providing more income and employment opportunities to Nigerian fish farmers. Let's start our value chain analysis by analyzing the industry structure and environment. The value chain is comprised of all the actors and functions that transform the raw materials and skills into goods and services and delivering them to the end consumer, adding value at each function in the chain. Value chains are driven by the end consumer, so the analysis must start by segmenting the end markets and defining the characteristics of those segments. Understanding how information flows from consumers down the chain to the producers will identify opportunities to make the value chain more efficient. This is done through a combination of underground interviews and other research, which we then use to build a value chain map which identifies the end markets and the relationships between the actors to get the product to the market. We'll start building our map using aquaculture as an example. Through research, we discovered the functions in producing farmed fish up to the market. Farmers buy fingerlings from the hatcheries, grow them into fish, sell them to the wholesalers or smokers. They then sell to retailers who sell to the end markets. Looking at the consumer first, we conducted our interviews. People like catfish a lot, but people demand for uh, catfish more than the other ones because of the taste. The, cat, the croaker and the tilapia are frozen, while the catfish is live fish. So that one is sweeter. When you have good fish, when your fish is good, like if we can breed these sizes, like that one that is in that rubber, if we can breed big sizes, you see the market women, they will, they will have more customers because when they buy from us, people will be trooping to the market to buy from us. Then when the fish is not big, you see people when they go there, they say the fish is not big, they wouldn't want to buy because most people, they like big fishes. When we smoke the fish, anything you use it to cook, 
to find out that the test is very nice. So many hotels in this town, in this worry here, worry Portai Court, Lagos. They order for our dry fish. The ethnic market is very large internationally. So we have people who are traveling outside Nigeria, they come in even to West Africa to buy our fish and take away. From these interviews, we discovered these market segments in Worry. Local household consumers buy fish for home use. Other consumers buy their fish at restaurants and hotels, including the popular point and kill eateries. Smoked fish is popular due to its flavor and its longevity. There is a national and international market for smoked fish. The consumer buys the fish depending on its size, its taste, its price, its freshness, and its availability. Delivering the fish to these end consumers are the wholesalers, retailers, and traders, and we interview them as well. People, they come market, come buy fish. This fish, they, they come many. For money, if you come market, go see all these hotelers, all these baby hotels, they will carry basic come, they go can't. Eh? All these uh, small, small hotels, they go come, they go buy, so we go sell. Since what I started to sell the business, the business is increasing. More people, they buy, more people, they sell. The worry aquaculture industry doesn't exist in a vacuum. It competes with fresh fish coming from other parts of Nigeria and frozen imports from outside Nigeria, while also linking to regional traders who take their smoked fish out to markets across the region. I bring the cut fish from Shagamu. If they put the fish they buy here in the bath and they put the one we brought from the west in the bath, people will as for our own than the one they rear here, because you will surely see the difference. I'm not be worried as as. I'm the one like all our worry. Our worry, I quote it. I have interest. It's not about when they are dry, they are dry. Yeah. I drive for people who just like to dry. I'll drive for them. They will pay me. I have some customers, some hotel where they come by, where they dry, where they dry fish for. Specialized smoking businesses prepare the smoked fish for the market. There are the traditional smokers, and modern smoking technologies are appearing to respond to larger demand. Of course, the largest group of actors in the value chain are the producers, the fish farmers themselves. I like doing one pound based on the capital, the food that cost, and I don't really have enough capital. If not, I would have liked to extend my farm. I go from fingerlings to post, from post to juvenile. From juvenile, it goes straight to the eating pond where I raise them to uh, a little less than five uh, 500 grams. And so we discovered Fish farmers come in varying sizes with varying skills and resources. Most of the farmers are small, with one to two ponds, producing one to two tons of fish every six months as a small business. They buy their baby catfish or fingerlings and fish feed from other sources. There are also medium and large growers who may have up to 50 or more ponds and produce up to five to 10 tons of fish per month. Medium-sized farmers will purchase fingerlings from modern hatcheries while a large farmer often runs an integrated farm, producing his own fingerlings and some of his own feed. There is also a subset of fish farmers who produce only fingerlings. These farmers operate at the small artisanal level, producing one to two harvests of fingerlings a year, while others have more structured hatcheries that produce large numbers and a more regular supply throughout the whole year. Now that we've met some of the actors in the Wari aquaculture value chain, the consumers, the retailers, the wholesalers, the smokers, the traders, and the farmers. We can start to see how they interact. The small producers can sell either into the fresh fish channel or into the smoked fish channel. On the fresh fish channel, the market mammies purchase directly from the producers and sell the product to the consumer and the catering industry. 
There is a traditional smoke channel and a modern smoke channel. The traditional smokers more often selling locally and the modern smokers selling more often to regional and occasional international markets. There are also importers bringing fish into worry. The relationships between the actors in getting the product to the end market may be vertical between actors who buy from or sell to one another or they may be horizontal between actors performing the same function. Effective coordination between the value chain actors, whether vertically or horizontally, can lead to more efficient transformation from raw material through to the end consumer. Coordination mechanisms such as associations can help actors address similar sets of constraints more effectively, mitigate risk and open up new opportunities. Our association is about 540 persons as, as of today. We advise the farmers on the best practice by educating them, by telling them what not to do. But there is also competition between the actors, particularly actors at the same functional level in the value chain, but in different channels. The fish smoker, for instance, competes with the fresh fish mummy for supply of fresh fish from the farmers. And the imported fresh fish competes with the locally produced fish. This competition can be healthy as it promotes firms to innovate and respond to market demand. For the value chain to operate efficiently, it needs many supporting services. This analysis helps us to understand these key interconnected systems and why and how they affect the industry. Feed suppliers sell feed to the farmers. The financial services industry provides investment and working capital. Technical advisors or consultants provide knowledge and skills. And fabricators build new technologies like the smoking kin. Hatcheries supply quality fingerlings. Some of these services are specific to the aquaculture value chain, like the fabricators and fish production consultants, while others cut across all value chains, like finance. But all are critical to the success of the industry, so they need to be interviewed. From the day you stock your fish into this eating pond, till you harvest, you must feed them. And often, that minimum is twice a day, maximum is four times a day. But the imported feed is better than the palletized feed. That has to do with the way it is processed, digestibility and the ingredients which we are using. It's not about the price of the feed, it's about the price and the quality and the results you get from the feed. From them, we learned that feed accounts for 60% of the cost of growing fish and that getting the best feed conversion ratio is a critical element to enhancing the competitiveness of the aquaculture sector. While the quality of feed can greatly affect the productivity of the farmers, they can also be price sensitive. So farmers often make uninformed trade-offs between imported feed and locally manufactured feed. Fish farming is a capital intensive business requiring good working capital to buy fingerlings and feed. A lot of persons just jump into the project they will have passion when they see the place and they say, ah, fish farming will be good, let me go into it. They don't have the needed capital lay before they jump into it. And it's such a business that you keep doing, you know, you keep putting money until after five or six months before you recoup. I have eight acres of farmland. I have only been able to develop 3.5 acres. The balance is there, undeveloped. A collateral worth um, 60 million I gave. But they, they, they couldn't agree to release anything more than five million. So as a banker, and if I'm approached by anybody or a fish farmer to ask for financing, the questions I'll ask is, I'd like to understand how much knowledge of fish farming the person has, how long the person has been exposed to that, where is he doing this fish farming, what is the market for the product, because when you grow the fish, you have to sell it. So if I give you a loan, the fish that you sell is where the money will come back to pay the loan. They need to be able to ha keep proper books. Most of them don't separate the money that goes into business. They don't know if you sit a typical farmer, whether it's a fish farmer, and ask him, how much have you put in this batch of fish? How much have you bought for feed? How much medication, if any? How much water cleaning? You know, they have to clean the water. How much petrol did you buy for your... Uh, generator and water pump, they won't be able to tell you. 
clearly because the, uh, their financial literacy is very low. We see that access to finance to farmers is difficult. It is expensive and hard for them to access loans. The lending products are often inappropriate for fish farming and it is difficult for the financial institutions to lend to the farmers who have low financial literacy, lack technical knowledge and have little collateral. Farmers need technical knowledge and business training, but where do they get this information? We rely on information from internet, we rely on information from uh, agricultural uh, 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 station officers, we rely on information from uh, seminars, workshop, training. We provide services, train farmers, set up farms, monitor and evaluate programs, get materials across to farmers, get new technologies across to them, even preparing feasibility studies, helping them to assess loans. The company has written now about four materials on fisheries. For instance, now 50 frequently asked questions we discovered from experience on the field that there are certain questions that keep occurring in the minds of farmers without any answer. So we provide it through that. So places we can't even go, our manuals go there. Yeah, I back up my clients with supervision and technical advice. I do uh, give them advices on their water management and disease management. Those are the core. Then may, maybe also on the aspect of uh, feeds. We learned that these services are available from consultants as well as other interconnected systems like hatcheries and feed companies. But many farmers still don't have regular access to reliable information. Another supporting service is the manufacturers of specialized equipment like the feed extruders or these improved smoking kilns which open up potential export market for smokers in Wari. At present, um, we produce roughly five smoking kilns per month. It has so many benefits over the traditional smoking kiln. The improved smoking kiln, as you can see, does not use electricity. It is lagged, it conserves so much heat. It removes the drudgery associated with the traditional smoking kiln. The smoking period is much less. It reduces smoking time from two to three days to four hours. Therefore, supporting industries play a critical role to address the constraints to the increased competitiveness of the aquaculture industry. Improved feed gives better feed conversion ratios, finance to meet working capital constraints, technical advice to improve farmer productivity and ability to monitor their finances, and improved smoking equipment to make smoked fish safer and more marketable. This will help inform the intervention strategy for phase three. National local and informal rules impact the aquaculture sector. National import duties on fish meal raise the cost of local fish feed. Lack of standards for fingerlings hampers the quality of supply and farmer trust in the suppliers. Conflict between fish farmers and the surrounding community affect the security and profitability of the farms. And then farmers have their own rules governing how they collaborate and compete on the farms. Global rules include international standards for smoked fish. These, however, are not enforced in Nigeria. These then are the four major components in initial value chain analysis, which provide us with the fundamentals of how the industry functions. Understanding the end markets, identifying and segmenting the actors in the value chain who transform and sell the products to those markets through vertical and horizontal linkages understanding the supporting services which allow these value chain actors to be more productive and competitive, clarifying the formal and informal rules which make up the enabling environment at the local, national and global levels. We are now ready to move to phase two where we'll analyze the dynamics of the sector and its driving forces. The analysis we have completed shows us what the situation is today. However, all value chains are dynamic Seeing how the structure of the aquaculture industry has changed and why will help us to understand the incentives driving this change and inform us on how it may change in the future. Through our research and interviews, we discovered that aquaculture in Wari is fairly new. 
Just 12 years ago, there was almost no farm catfish around Wari, and most of the catfish were imported. But with the strong demand for fish, the introduction of new species like the Clara's fingerlings, new technologies, appropriate feed, and improved production techniques, the sector began to grow. By 2007, thousands of new farmers had entered the value chain. Entirely new functions such as catfish smoking were creating new channels for supply to the consumers. New specialized hatcheries began and supporting services like feed and technical advice started. This evolution has continued with even more farmers entering the value chain and new types of smoking technology opening up new channels and markets. Many elements have combined to drive this change. High local prices early on made it very profitable for small farmers to enter the value chain and attracted investment. New services and technologies have improved productivity. This has meant the supply has increased and the cost of fish has reduced considerably. Therefore, a growing and more efficient aquaculture sector has already responded to consumer interest and increasing demand. In those days, you can't get it easily. In where we, my mother would tell us that ah, it's only big people that eat this fish. Oh. But now, because of the fish farm, everybody can buy it. If you have 400, 500, you can go for one that will give you maybe the portion of soup that you want that will take you and your family for that day. However, for the value chain to continue to serve as an effective engine of economic growth in worry, our research has highlighted that it must address a number of constraints. The local worry market for fresh fish is getting saturated. Fish farmers need to find new markets outside of worry, most likely led by smoked fish. The business is increasing. More people they buy, more people they sell. Production has escalated to the point that uh, we can no longer even we, we produce above, above our sales. What we are producing these, these days is above our sales. We manage the sales by regulating uh, billing uh, activities. Fish farmers also need to produce fish that respond to market demand. The people that come from Ibadan, they give all the best fish. Ibadan people give all the best fish and beneath. And it's strong, we can keep it at least one week. There are some influx of other fishes from, from the west. They, they come from there because they have the their source of input is relatively cheaper than what we have here. So their price is usually cheaper. Their fish may be big, but their price are usually very, uh, very lower than what's obtainable here. We can find it difficult to compete with them. Farmers must continue to increase their productivity to reduce the prices to end consumers, to stimulate more local demand, compete with imports, and promote exports. They will need more access to better supporting services. Farmers need lower cost, high quality feed to improve the feed conversion ratio, resulting in more kilograms of fish per kilograms of feed. Farmers need better knowledge of how to manage their inputs and account for them to know if they are making money. They also need access to better quality fingerlings, which will grow faster and convert the feed more efficiently improved access to finance to purchase the inputs they need, and new smoking equipment to open up new markets. Now we've drawn our value chain map and understand the dynamics and constraints within the industry, we can now move on to the third phase, which is developing a strategy and interventions. We need to find cost-effective solutions to these problems. Helping each farmer one by one is very expensive. Finding ways to reach larger numbers of value chain actors at a time by using leverage improves cost effectiveness. We can find a number of points of leverage in the aquaculture sector where we increase our impact and lower our cost of support. These points of leverage include focusing on government policies which affect many aquaculture actors at the same time, such as the establishment of standards for smoked fish. Targeting geographic clusters that allow us to reach many farmers together in one place, such as the United Ufuma Fish Farmers Association, that organizes marketing for their members, or working with lead firms and supporting services, such as the feed companies or the banks that interact with many value chain actors all at the same time. 
Addressing these constraints in a sustainable manner requires getting below the symptoms to understand their root causes. For example, why are the farmers not using the best feed? The symptom is that it's too expensive, but the cause is probably that they do not understand the feed conversion ratio, how to manage the ponds to give the best results, or that the feed companies are not selling the most appropriate feed. So, an intervention would need to bring together the different market actors, the farmers, the feed producers, to change the behavior of the farmers to want to buy the feed, as well as the behavior of the suppliers of feed to understand the market potential and distribute the feed into these high growth areas. As we design the interventions to address improving access to quality feed and fingerlings, increasing access to sound advice on production, increasing access to finance, and opening up new markets, we will look to these points of leverage to advise our efforts. Important to our success, we must ensure that we bring in the right partners, such as the associations, the feed companies, the hatcheries, and the trainers to lead the activities. They have market-driven incentives to invest and make the sector grow and succeed. The value chain approach has helped us understand the relationships between the various actors, the enabling environment and the services needed to support the sector. We have seen the dynamics in aquaculture. It identified how the sector is evolving, the incentives for actors to coordinate, the forces driving the change, and has also pinpointed key points of leverage for critical interventions. These factors help us set a vision for enhanced growth of the sector. With the right vision and implementation strategy and applying our support at the right points of leverage, aquaculture can meet the demand for food while also generating broad-based growth in incomes and employment. This is a business that can grow over time. Give fish farm another three years if every party is involved, that the chain from the fingerling supplier down to the consumer, which means from the fingerling supplier down to the consumer, there is something in between. From the day I cultivate the fish to become table size, for something to come and buy it, process, sell or not, it means it's going to be a chain of reaction where jobs will be created.